Hi everyone, it is Professor Lung and today we'll be going over some examples of rangeland grazing management um, from a few case studies um, in California rangelands where um, different managers have manipulated grazing factors uh, for specific management practices. So understanding grazing factors are really important in order to effectively manipulate them um, for our purposes in rangeland management. Targeted and managed grazing can be a really useful uh, management practices um, to manipulate grazing um, and be used for different practices such as biomass removal or reducing fire risk through removing um, residual dry matter. Grazing can also help manage um, and be used to benefit endangered and rare plants, especially those that might be having issues with invasive species competition or maybe need some more bare ground and open space in order to successfully um, complete their life cycle um, or to establish and germinate at the beginning of the season. Grazing can also be used similarly to improve great wildlife habitat and insect habitat to increase habitat heterogeneity for some species like ground nesting bees or other um, insects that we will see later on another slide. Um, some of them require bare ground for nesting um, and grazing can be useful for increasing the amount of bare ground or providing small patches of bare ground throughout a landscape. And finally, targeted and managed grazing can also be used for conservation um, and for specifically native and non-native species management if timed effectively. So our first example is going to be from the Willits Wetland Bypass, which is about two and a half to three hours south of here, about 150 miles. If you're familiar, if you've driven south on the 101, you will have definitely passed by it several times on your way or out of Humboldt. Um, and here they had a giant um, bypass built over and parts of these areas are now grazed or they've always been grazed. Um, parts of the areas are now taken out of grazing. Uh, but in particular, the areas that are being grazed um, manipulate grazing intensity and frequency and duration and selectivity to ensure biomass removal and help achieve different types of management goals. So at the Willits Wetland Bypass, there's a lot of different um, management goals. Some of them related to grazing um, may be related to um, reducing the cover of very tall plants that have very continuous cover to reduce fire risk um, for nearby property owners in that area. It may also be important to manage grazing in that area to reduce the amount of non-native or undesirable plant species cover um, like Phalaris arundinacea um, or aquatica in these areas, reed canary grass and harding grass. Another reason um, you may have to manipulate grazing in this case for example is seasonal suitability um, parts of the year in willets uh, the area is completely inundated and covered by water and so it's not always best to graze during those times and so we're just going to go over a couple of these factors so for example at the willets wetland bypass grazing manager land managers manipulate grazing intensity by adjusting stocking rates in order to achieve different goals related to um, maximum plant height on the field as well related to fire risk. And this can be related to both um, timing and frequency. And so you have to put the cattle or grazers out at the right time um, to ensure soil protection. And again, like I mentioned, this area gets flooded regularly. So we wanna make sure we put the cattle or grazers out um, during the right time when it's not too wet because if it's too wet, you could have further risk of soil compaction. Um, using fre manipulating frequency can also be important into, in achieving plant height and fire risk goals um, because maybe you graze it the first time and then it grows back and or it doesn't achieve the desirable height. And maybe you have to um, implement an additional grazing period to ensure the plant height is reduced um, for a, a, a for a um, for the specific goals and then you may also have to adjust duration and selectivity to ensure that the grazers or livestock actually remove the biomass you're targeting um, because it may not be the most desirable forage and so sometimes they may target other species um, before targeting some of these less desirable species that we're hoping to manage 
And so keeping the cattle out on that specific area longer can help um, ensure that they target those species. And so in Willets, here's an example. Of, this is an example of how they have manipulated all of these different grazing factors, including intensity, timing, frequency, and selectivity to reach their various management goals. The next example we have is from Napomo, California, which are um, some dune rangelands I work in. And there we're specifically concerned about an uh, endangered species called the Napomo lupin, also known as Lupinus nipomensis. There, most of its existing habitat is invaded by uh, a noxious, non-native uh, grass called velvet grass, um, Erharta calicinia, and it's a bunch of grass that grows and um, often causes dune stabilization. Oftentimes they grow in really dense, um, dense populations, often um, removing around bare ground required for germination and also causing shading and intense competition um, to this endangered plant. And so funny enough, the only population of this species occurs on a conic uh, ConocoPhillips um, oil field. Um, and this is where they actually um, manage grazing in order to, um, again, ensure the sustainability and um, persistence of this endangered species population. And so in these June rangelands in Nampomo, California, they typically manipulate grazing timing and grazing intensity. Um, they manipulate grazing intensity um, through adjusting the stocking rates. And their goal there is essentially to um, get effective removal of invasive species, Erharta calicinia, um, on that landscape. They manipulate timing because um, grazing is not allowed at all when these plants are actively growing in the, seed, in the spring. And so grazing is only allowed on these June rangelands um, from about June until, uh, until around November when these plants aren't actively growing. Um, and we, uh, the managers there take cattle off those dune rangelands um, during active growth seasons in order to ensure that these populations aren't um, grazed upon um, too heavily and that that way they also aren't trampled and they can survive and persist and um, produce uh, and support future populations. However, interestingly enough, uh, we just recently rediscovered a population on the oil field that was not have, didn't have restrictive grazing and were grazed um, continuously year round. And we actually found huge populations of this endangered species in that little sub parcel, um, a few hundred plants. Um, and so this is an example of how grazing can be manipulated for timing and intensity for endangered species management um, on dune rangelands in Southern California. Next, we have another example from the Willows Bypass, specifically in wet meadows, where we're managing, where land managers are managing for a threatened plant species called North Coast semaphore grass, also known as Pleuropogon hooveriensis. Um, and there, they again also manipulate timing, intensity, frequency, and selectivity, as we saw for the kind of general wetland bypass. However, the goals here are slightly different than the goals out in the kind of more open areas where they're managing for fire risk and plant height related to some of these noxious species. With these wet meadows that are typically occurring on the understory of oak trees, um, where these North Coast semaphore grass occur, um, they also manipulate grazing intensity with stocking rates. Um, they manipulate timing because again, parts of this area also get very wet. And so they have to um, very strategically place cattle out at appropriate times to limit soil compaction um, and also limit damage to re-germinating or re-sprouting um, Pleuropogon hooveriensis um, from their tillers because they're perennial plant species that, um, re um, that re-sprout during the wet season. And so we also have to limit cattle grazing during that time for that reason. And then um, they manipulate the intensity because out there cattle have to graze upon all kinds of um, non-native annual grasses, but also from, for less desirable species that aren't really made for cattle, um, like blackberry. And so they have to really keep the cattle there much longer to increase, um, decrease the selectivity and allow and or I guess force the cattle 
to kind of munch on some of that blackberry as well as trample it down. And then they can manipulate frequency and implement multiple grazing period um, in order to achieve their reduction in invasive species cover um, as needed while balancing um, cover of this uh, threatened plant species. In this example, we have the Ohlone tiger beetle from UC Santa Cruz, which is an endangered insect insect that occurs in the coastal prairies in um, the Santa Cruz area. And so on the UC Santa Cruz campus, where I had the opportunity to develop uh, campus grassland management plans, there were certain campus grasslands that supported endangered population or populations of this endangered species, the Ohlone tiger beetle, um, which is the beetle right above me. Ohlone is the um, tribal groups that occupied that area um, previously. And so these Ohlone tiger beetles occur in various patches across Santa Cruz and these coastal prairies, um, like one called Mima Meadow that you can see in the picture on the left with the, the, the longhorn cattle there. Um, and there, um, these Ohlone tiger beetle actually need bare ground in order to nest and complete its life cycle and to ensure its persistence into the future. And so again, at Santa Cruz and in those coastal prairies in that area, um, land managers manipulate grazing timing and grazing intensity. And so grazing doesn't occur actively while these beetles are um, roaming free, essentially, and completing its life cycle during the spring period, the early winter to spring, generally around February to May. And then it's grazed other parts of the year um, to, again, remove biomass, to create this habitat heterogeneity, um, and to support bare ground that supports this endangered insect species. They also adjust stocking rates depending on the amount of forage production that year um, that is related to the amount of precipitation that that area might receive. And then finally, we have another example of grazing manipulation of um, both of all intensity, timing, and frequency for weed management um, in a grassland, restored, gra managed grassland, um, managed by the Big Sur Land Trust in Salinas called Mark's Ranch. And in this area, um, land managers, the Big Sur Land Trust, work with a local rancher to manipulate uh, stocking rates or grazing intensity, as well as timing um, and frequency for weed management. And similar to the example I, I talked about in class the other day, um, managers here typically um, set cattle out early in the winter when invasive species are first germinating to kind of cause some disturbance to limit their growth and hopefully promote the germination of native species um, later in that wet season. And then they put cattle, uh, and this is uh, high intensity, short duration. This is uh, typically about 10 cattle for um, about, uh, oh God, uh, two to four hectares. Um, and they're kept on this range for about um, 10 to 14 days. And then they're removed and then they're brought back in um, the spring when the invasive annual grasses start to bolt or start to produce their flowering culms, um, but, the non, but the native perennial bunch grasses have not yet begun to bolt. Grazing at this time allows the cattle to remove the inflorescence stalks of these invasive annual grasses a lot of them have more shallow root systems and will not be able to effectively recover. Some of them may experience mortality, which is something that we might be targeting, or they may at least have reduced seed production to reduce the seed bank and germination and competition in subsequent years. Because the native perennial bunch grasses have not yet started flowering, they're able to easily recover with their vegetative growth and actively photosynthesize and grow back leaves. And then about two to three weeks later, they generally start to flower and produce their flowering culms and bolt. Um, and then um, they don't have as much competition for resources from the invasive annual grasses. And then you take the cattle off after, again, they have grazed for about seven to 10 days when from when you, uh, sorry, seven to 14 days from when you initially put them on. And then again, in the later parts of the year, um, maybe around late May, early June, you might put cattle back onto that landscape to then target the invasive 
perennial bunch grasses that begin to bolt in with our climate, which might be something like Dactylus, Glomerata, or Holcus linatus, velvet grass. Um, and at this point, the native perennial grasses will have completed their flowering and seed production. And if they experience herbivory, it won't be as serious as because they're going into dormancy. And that will help incorporate the seeds they produced into the seed bank. And, and again, it helps remove the flowering columns from our non-desired noxious perennial bunch grasses um, and helps reduce the overall seed production they put into the seed bank um, in subsequent years and hopefully it could cause some mortality um, of those undesirable species. And so those are our, a few examples from California rangelands of different rangeland types um, of how different rangeland managers might manipulate grazing intensity grazing timing, grazing frequency, or the duration to manipulate grazing collectivity. Have a nice rest of your day.